I've been in broadcasting for well over 25 years, and I've only twice in my career uh, interviewed an astronomer pastor. This is the third time, and guess what? It's the same guy. <laughs> Dr. Hugh Ross, Dr. Ross, thanks for coming our way. You've, you've reissued a matter of days. You're the founder of Reasons to Believe. You're well known as an astronomer, as a pastor, as a debater in campuses around the world. And uh, you have a very uh, well-studied uh, view of creation. Um, f first question, and we've not had a chance to talk about this before because this is news. The Hubble telescope, uh, 25 years now, it's been, it's been celebrated 25 years. I've been watching with rapt attention uh, the various documentaries out on the Hubble. And I have sat there with my mouth wide open at times, marveling at the, at the vastness of the universe, the intricacies of the universe. And when looking at the universe from the Hubble perspective, you almost get the impression with the billions, if not trillions, of galaxies and heavenly bodies out there that this little galaxy that we're a part of is nothing other than a little bit of dust whirling around in the outer fringes of, of this massive entity. You almost get the feeling that we're a part of a body. Yeah, I mean, there's over 200 billion galaxies. Ours is just one of those 200 there's billion. There's 200 billion galaxies. And, and some of these 200 galaxies... 200 billion medium and large-sized galaxies. There's even more small ones. And, and, and these galaxies, in many cases, have billions of, uh, of stars and planets. Correct. But we need every one of them to have life here on planet Earth. If you make the universe slightly bigger or slightly smaller, there's no possibility for life anywhere in the universe. You know, you make that point in the book, and when I was reading that part of it, I, I was thinking, really? Like that, that suggests a kind of um, almost an egocentric view of the universe that it's all about us. It is all about us. It is all about us. Yeah, the whole universe exists to make a home for humanity. And without the universe, we wouldn't be here. Now, is this Hugh Ross, the astronomer speaking, or Hugh Ross, the pastor speaking here? When it's you say both. All for us. Uh, and, I mean, this is widely accepted within the astronomical community that the universe must be fine-tuned in terms of its mass, its size, its age, in order to make a home for human beings. So just, you know, I'm a layman on the, by, by a long shot on this subject, but most of our viewers are too. Give us a sense of that fine-tunedness. What, is, what is, is it about Earth that makes us uh, habitable? Well, if you make the universe slightly more massive, then all you get are elements heavier than iron and life is not possible. Make the universe slightly less massive, all you get is hydrogen and helium. Both cases, you lack the carbon, the nitrogen, the oxygen you need for life. So you have to be living in this vast, massive universe. And it must be exquisitely fine-tuned in order to just get the elements that makes life possible. But then you look at planet Earth, and I'm coming with a book next year on planet Earth and its life, and how we live on a planet that's got water on its surface and continents on its surface. And it's because of the plate tectonics that's been operating for billions of years that we have this planet. But without oceans and continents coexisting on the surface for a long period of time, you can't get the nutrient recycling. You can't get the oxygen transformation you need in order to make advanced life possible. Yes, you could conceivably have a home for bacterium, not for very long, but just for a short period of time. But if you want a home for advanced life, birds, mammals, and human beings, it needs to be a planet exactly like planet Earth. So you're, you wouldn't expect to find life on any other planet? Well, a lot of my colleagues who are not Christians would say, there's a good chance we might find a place where bacteria could exist. Right. But if we're talking humans, we're probably alone. We're alone in the vastness of the universe because we are finding planets all over our galaxy but none of the planets we're discovering are like any of the planets in our solar system, which has caused us astronomers to recognize not only must you fine-tune the Earth, you have to fine-tune Mars and Venus and Jupiter and Saturn and Neptune. All the planets in our solar system play a critical role in making advanced life possible on planet Earth, and our moon does as well. 20 different features of our moon must be fine-tuned to make advanced life possible here on planet Earth. So when it tells us in the Bible that the heavens declare the glory of God, everywhere we look in the universe, we see that declaration. Uh, the scripture also says we're fearfully and wonderfully made, but what you're telling me is that uh, the planet is fearfully and wonderfully made. It is, and all of its life is fearfully. I mean, we talk about the whole universe existing to make a home for humanity. 
the whole history of life on planet Earth must be exactly the way it is in order for us human beings to show up at this narrow window of time. Now, I'm going to shift gears here. Uh, about, I think about three years ago, two and a half years ago, I was doing some extended uh, kind of uh, help, uh, helping out here at Crossroads. And during that period of time, there was a big conference held up uh, on Lake Simcoe in northern Ontario, or near north. Uh, about 11, uh, what they call themselves, uh, young earth scientists were there. They all had written books. I had to read all their books, and then I in interviewed them back to back for a day. I don't know how I kept my mind clear. But when I mentioned the name Hugh Ross, they're not too happy to hear that name. No, they're not. And, and uh, in fact, I detected, you, you use the word in here, fierceness, the fierceness of the relationship between what's called young earthers and old earthers. You're an old earther. Right. Uh, and you, you hope for and wish for some kind of rapprochement, some kind of right. understanding, some kind of, let, hey, let's find the common ground and be nice to each other position. But it seems to me the antipathy to, uh, on the part of young earthers to old earthers will, will not diminish. Why is that? Well, if you go back into Book of Acts, there was another church-splitting controversy that had nothing to do with salvation. It was circumcision. Mm. And the real motivation is you had certain Christians that didn't want Gentiles fellowshipping with That's them. Right. So they came up with a doctrine to make it very difficult for Gentile men to get involved. Yeah. Well, what I've noticed in church history, every era of the church has had a church-splitting controversy that has had nothing to do with salvation. Mm. Today, our issue is the age of the earth. It's a church-splitting controversy. It's got nothing to do with salvation, but it's very effective at keeping the engineers and the scientists in the church quiet. And so I don't think this controversy is going to go away until Christian engineers and scientists get involved in the life of the church and stop being wallflowers but actually get engaged in, mm. in ministry. And also I'd argue that if we're going to complete the Great Commission in our generation, we're going to have to recruit the engineers and the scientists to assist us. Because the big barrier to people coming to faith in Christ in these non-Christian nations, especially the Islamic world, uh, the atheistic nations, is science. Mm. And the Bible actually commands us to use the book of nature to bring people to the book of Scripture. God gave us two revelations. Mm. And I think that's the big division between old earth and young earth creationists. You know, my passion is to integrate both of God's books. But within the young earth community is the idea that the book of nature can't be trusted unless it's interpreted through the lens of the book of scripture. And personally, I'm sympathetic to that. The two books have to agree. Uh, it's a hermeneutical issue. It's, it's a hermeneutical yeah, issue, which, right. which is a big theological word, friends, for interpret, interpretive issue. How you interpret the meaning of uh, a matter of days. How, right. how you interpret the meaning of day and days in, in Genesis 1. One argument says it's a literal 24-hour day. Another argument says it's uh, an age. Uh, the reference is made to the scripture that says a day is like a thousand years in God's sight. Uh, then you have the added complication of uh, did God start something and then just leave it, which would be called theism. Right. And as there's a theistic evolutionist, then you have the deistic perspective that he not only created, he designed it, and he's, he's, he's very much a part of what's happening. But what I find interesting about young earther and old earther is they're both, those are both adjectives for creationist. Right. So, so you got young earth creationists, you got old earth creationists, but never the twain shall meet. The huge gap there. Is, is it because of a view of inerrancy of the scripture? Is that the issue? Well, I would argue that you can't take the Bible inerrantly in terms of reading all the creation texts in the Bible unless you take an old earth perspective. If you take a young earth perspective, then different creation texts contradict other creation texts, even in Genesis 1 and 2. Because Genesis 1 says that God created both the human male and the human female on the sixth day. But Genesis 2 is a significant passage of time between God creating Adam and God creating Eve. And what struck me when I first read a Gideon Bible at age uh, 17, it says there's no evening and morning for the seventh day. Right we're still in the seventh day. And when I read that, it said it answers the fossil record enigma. Why we see so much speciation before humanity and we see virtually none afterwards. 
For six days God created. On the seventh day he ceased from his work of creation. Now he will create again, but it's the new creation after God has completed his work of redemption. When I was reading that part of your book, I, I thought of uh, the book of Hebrews that talks about God's rest. Right. Uh, which I think is a Sabbath concept. It's a Sabbath concept. Yeah. And it's not that we stop everything on the Sabbath. We stop certain things to focus on other things that are more significant. And what I appreciate about the biblical creation text, God's works of redemption precede his works of creation. All of creation is in the context of redemption. And so this helps us understand, you know, on the seventh day, the focus is on redeeming the humans that God created. We've got two minutes. Um, the scientific community in general, with whom you interface all of the time, um, are they more inclined these days to opt for at least design, uh, if not necessarily for creationism, but for at least some kind of design or designer in the um, complex universe in which we live? Or are you kind of persona non grata on both sides? The young earthers don't like you. <laughs> And the, and the, uh, the secular scientists uh, think that you're a little off because you claim to be a creationist. Where do you fit into that? And, and, and where is the scientific community going with this creationist idea? Well, it, I have to tell Christians it's not design. All scientists agree that they see design when they look at nature. Right. The real question is who or what is responsible for the design? Does design necessarily imply a designer? Well, you got atheists saying no. You can have design without an intelligent designer. Nature did it all without an intellect or a mind, which is why I'm so passionate about saying if you look at the history of life on planet Earth, it's clear you need a mind that knows the future physics of the solar system to make sure you got the right life on the planet at the right time. And if it's without a mind, it's going to quickly get out of sync and the planet will become permanently sterile. Uh, what, what is your, your website? Uh, Reasons.org. Reasons.org. Reasons Reasons.org. Uh, the book is called A Matter of Days, and it's an expanded edition, I think a little over 70 pages of new material. Correct. Uh, resolving a creation controversy. It's, it's a book that you, uh, i got to warn you, it's a read. I mean, this is not a book that, you know, it's not casual reading. Uh, maybe it is for you, Hugh. Well, it's not casual reading, but it's a book designed to resolve this controversy. Yeah. I mean, in the first century, the Jerusalem Council resolved the division between Gentiles and Jews. Yeah. I'm praying as a pastor that this book will resolve the controversy. Well, I hope so. 